to, to begin, um, you know, I, I photographed a lot of conflict for the New York Times, um, and I, I, I didn't plan it out that way. I just kind of, you know, my, my hire at the paper coincided with the beginning of two big American wars, um, obviously Afghanistan and Iraq. And, um, you know, after a while, you're, you know, you're kind of going to these places. Your name just kind of keeps coming up in their Rolodex, so they keep calling you. Um, and uh, those wars lasted a long time. And after a while, you kind of look in the mirror, and uh, at least for me, I realized I went gray. And uh, a lot of time had passed. And some of my friends here who, who are sitting some, a lot at this table, too, are a little bit more gray hair as well. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, a lot of what we do is transport ourselves to, to bad places. I mean, that's, that's kind of the big part of this job is we, we, we take ourselves from our homes and our loved ones and we put ourselves in very unfamiliar places where often it's very hostile. And that comes with considerable risk. It's, it's rarely a sunny place to be. Other people in this room, I know I'm not talking to, 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 to rookies here. You've all done amazing things with your careers, and, 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 and a good number of you have taken risks of your own. And uh, it's, uh, I'm a little scared and humbled to be up here talking to you. <laughs> people ask me why I take the risks that I do to, to, to do this job. And it's, it's always kind of a, that's a difficult question to answer. Um, and, and when we, we were just talking about Carlotta Gall and you know, that she always says like, you know, picture is never worth your life. Obviously that's true, but um, you know, I'm, I'm, this work can, can reward you really in amazing ways and it can also punish you um, in a completely blindsiding way. Um, I'm not a thrill seeker. Um, I, I, I really dislike the, the term uh, 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 adrenaline junkie. You know, when people say, are you adrenaline junkie? I say, you know, that's, that, I find kind of offensive. They're, they're much easier and safer ways to, to satisfy boredom than, than going into a war zone. I mean, you can go to, <laughs> onto an outward bound course or something like that. Um, we take these risks because we, we want to validate what's happening around the world. And we hope that by being there to document it firsthand, that that, that will bring truth and hopefully change, positive change. Uh, no one can pay you any amount of money to do this type of work. It's not the kind of thing that you do for that. It's, um, and really for, for, for the type of work that I do as a photographer, it's really, I, I feel like my job is kind of a trade. Like I get, I get uh, I'm 95% I'm of it is just to get to places, kind of to, to read body language, to get past people who are trying to stop me from taking my pictures, from doing my work. That's the biggest part of this job, in my opinion, at least. The other 5% is once you're actually there and you realize you're in that moment and you push the shutter on your camera and you start getting what you arrived for. And, you know, I'm, I'm very lucky uh, to have my job at the New York Times. It's, it's like to have a big audience for the pictures. And I don't think that a picture is really, you know, it's not worth going out there and putting yourself at risk and putting other people around you at risk if the picture is not going to be seen in, in some way. It, it has to be published. To me, that picture doesn't have any value without it being published. And, and, and the, 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 the risk in, in, in taking those chances and going to places where there's combat or any kind of, it doesn't have to be a war, it can be any place where, where people are going to be hostile. I think everyone has like an internal thermostat that, that determines your level of, of how much you can push it. And, and, and I know people who are way above me. Um, mine sways a lot. It goes, 
very, very much in, in two directions. Um, in the case we were, as you're talking about Westgate Mall, um, I'm going to show some pictures. And everything I'm going to show you tonight is really recent work. I, I kind of wanted to, to, to show you stuff that's been happening in, uh, you know, in my life recently. Um, you know, this was a, a moment that came. It was almost like a sign, you know, like you, you, you carry around a camera for, for, your, for your whole life thinking maybe, maybe something will happen. Um, in this case, it did. Uh, um, I, 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 this is where I live in Nairobi, a big, big shopping mall that, um, that came under attack by Somali militants, Al-Shabaab. When I first arrived, it was really, um, you know, it, 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 it was immediately clear there was something very bad happening inside. You know, all these people were running out. Um, it was very disorganized. And um, a lot of people had been, you know, it was clear within just a few minutes that, um, you know, people have been shot. Uh, this woman in the center actually died not long after this picture was taken. Um, uh, she, she seemed fine. She's, you know, injured, ran past me. But there was no facility to, to, to help people. There was only a couple of ambulances, and people were literally bleeding to death on the sidewalk. One of the problems of, 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 uh, of, of being in a place like Kenya. Um, as I kind of approached, uh, you know, it wasn't an immediate uh, decision to go inside the mall. There was so much going on outside. Um, and bodies and pe injured people and emotion and um, but really I could con still hear gunfire inside and it became clear to me that the real story was inside the mall and I, I, I saw an opportunity to go in um, and it was really one of these moments that that I thought you know what what am I doing I, I uh, you know, there's a lot of gunfire still happening. You can see here in the foreground, a man's been killed, a lot of bodies around, and, and very disorganized. I mean, this is a place where the police and the military are very undertrained. And it was gruesome. These photographs, you know, they're not easy to look at, but, you know, this was mass murder, mostly headshots, women, children, um, it, it was it was uh, pretty amazing. We were talking about this picture before. Something is like you never get uh, you, the, the, that happens as you you know breaking news happens around you, and you never get to actually know what happened to people. It's very hard to follow up. Um, and and this woman is laying here with her two children. She laid there for four hours. Um, and and the, the strange thing about this mall is that there was this, this music, the mall music, continued to play. And she sang those songs to those kids and had to keep that little boy calm for four hours while people were literally getting killed around her. She got in touch with me uh, after she saw some of my pictures run. And I actually had a, like a, a, a video Skype <laughs> talk with her. She was on her iPad with her husband and her family. And I saw these kids running around and playing and having dinner. And it was just so... So great to, to be at, at, like, at, at something so, such a tragedy, and then to have actually one happy story at the end of it. Um, it was difficult to work there, um, constantly the, the police and military kicking me out, getting back in, worried that my discs would get taken away. Um, but it, it was, was really, for me, this, this, one of the things that I was actually thinking about while I was taking these pictures is that this is not only just about this, what happened, what was happening, another African tragedy, but, you know, these mass shootings. You have you know, Sandy Hook Elementary in Connecticut and, um, you know, a tourist island in, in, in Norway that is, is uh, uh, attacked. Uh, these mass shootings that, that really tap into the fear of of all of us and can happen anywhere in the world. Um, and you know, no life is worth any, any less than, than another. Um, I was really, you know, we, we, we hope to learn through our peers about how to, how to become better journalists, how to, how to, in my case, how to operate in the field and, and stay safe and alive. Um, 
I was really fortunate to have Chris Chivers by my side, better part of the last 10 years. Um, you know, that, that guy is like the closest thing to, to a, a textbook education on, on, on surviving in a war zone. Um, you know, I'll always be indebted to him for that. And, and um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard for people who, who don't have that, who don't, who, who, you know, whether they're freelance or just don't have that buddy system to bounce off of. Um, one of the places that, that really allows you to, to, to gauge the type of risk that you take is Gaza, where I was this summer. Um, this is a place that, that's always been very <coughs> dear to me as far as, you know, anytime something happens, I, I really do my best to try to go. It's, it's a place that you can work with, with an enormous amount of freedom. It's small. It doesn't take very long to get to places. Um, people are brave, the drivers, the translators. They've grown up with this. It, it's really uh, represents everything about what a, what a, what a, what a photojournalist would, would hope as far as a place that you can cover and, and, and make decisions in the field to, to how far you want to push it. Um, this was, I had been there the year prior to um, an, an, an conflict that I thought was bad, but was very much not as bad as this one. This was really, really pushed it. And I had a different feeling this time around. I was very, I felt very angry about the amount of civilian casualty I was seeing, especially children. And I found myself, you know, I'd go to the morgue and, and they'd, they'd pull out another tray with three, four kids on it. And, and I, I almost just didn't feel like taking pictures. It was like I was more disgusted than anything else. It's like, you know, are these pictures making a difference? Um, one day I was, uh, I had been out working, you know, shooting pictures like these. This is, you go out early in the morning. It's really routine. You go out, you, you shoot a funeral. You see what kind of bombings happened the night before. You go by the morgue. There's, there's, there is very much kind of like this, this strange routine that happens in, in places like this. Um, I'd been out in the morning, and I went back to my room with my, my driver and uh, having a Coca-Cola, taking a break. It's very hot out. We heard a large explosion uh, just outside the, my, my hotel on the beachfront. And... Uh, I looked out and I saw smoke rising um, from, from a seawall and uh, a group of boys running across the beach away from it. And a bomb, had, a rocket had hit on the beach. My immediate instinct was to grab my flak jacket and cameras and, and to rush out to see what happened. And as I turned to grab my equipment, another explosion, this one closer, cracked outside the window. When I looked out, those, those very boys that I had seen running were all dead, just lifeless on the beach. My driver started just screaming under, uncontrollably. We ran down to the edge of the beach, and, and uh, uh, um, um, I, I, I reached the sand, and that's kind of like where my, my thermostat said, don't go any further. Two big rockets had already hit in a big open area. And it was strange because there were no people out there yet. It was very quiet. And that's one of the things about combat that, you know, unlike, I mean, a lot of you have experience in this, but, but it's, it's, it can, it's never kind of what you think it's going to be like, the sounds and the smells. This point is very quiet, and a group of people came. They rushed out onto the, the, the beach, and that's when I joined them. Uh, and, and they, you know, scooped up these, these lifeless boys. And I actually, um, my driver was so distraught after this, taking these pictures, that I had to, that he fainted. And I found myself in an ambulance with my driver taking him to the hospital. You know, the, the, these, these things really take a toll on the civilian population um, in, 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 in incredible ways. It's uncommon for the paper to run a paper picture like that one on the front page. They did. 
I, I, I don't often make an argument um, unless I really, really think that it's important. In this case, I did, and and they put it out there. And I, I, I you know, I, I really hoped it, it it underscored the rising civilian death toll to Israel's assault there. And um, you know, you, you hope that those pictures can can maybe speed up a ceasefire to advanced discussions and people will see those pictures. That's, that's our goal. The way that Gaza permits us to make those decisions about risk, about when to run out onto the beach, about when to, to go out driving around at first light, whether it's still too dangerous, these things, it's, it's that, that kind of arena is getting smaller and smaller. A lot of what we rely on is luck. Um, and luck works until you get a, until you, uh, until it doesn't, you know, as long as you get away with it, taking risks is worth it. Um, I lost that bet in Libya in 2011, stayed too long in a place that was being attacked by, uh, um, Gaddafi fighters, ran into a uh, militia checkpoint out in the desert, really the worst case scenario where, as, as I was being captured with my colleagues, their checkpoint was simultaneously attacked by the people that I had just been with. So uh, we're dream being dragged out of the car while bullets are hitting our car from the so-called friendly side. Um, they immediately executed my driver, uh, two of their uh, the, the, the Gaddafi uh, military fighters were, were, were killed in the incoming fire. Um, and, and we really you know, narrowly escaped with our lives. We were lucky. Um, this was kind of a beginning of a very, very dark time for journalists. Um, Libya kind of started to transform into a, a, a multi-stage militia. Of course, Miss Rada and Holmes claimed the lives of some of our very good friends. It was like a succession of waves that changed the way we, we cover some of the darkest parts of the world. A lot of people decided it wasn't worth the risk anymore, that this is just, you know, enough is enough. Too much is happening. It's got too dangerous out there. And, or the, the organizations that, that, that send us out there decided that they weren't going to send them anymore. Um, you know, even people who wanted to go. So you get this much smaller group going. And in, in, in 2012, um, you know, it was the last time I was in Syria, again with Chris Shivers. Uh, we were in, staying in Aleppo in a, a small apartment. And you know, this is one of these things that it was very hard to, to, to work. Um, jumping out of the car, taking pictures from inside the car, spending two minutes in a place, very frustrating. Um, you could really kind of feel the noose tightening on, on our ability to work. And, and it, it, we, we, we discussed at the time, you know, this, let's get everything we can now because soon this place is gonna be overrun and we're not gonna be able to come here anymore. And, and it's, it's really, hard because this is an important story, not just in, in, in Syria, but in Iraq and, and all throughout the region that ISIS now controls. Um, risk taking again, we were driving around and we saw, we stumbled up on this little demonstration of about a hundred people waving a black flag, people denouncing the Free Syria army and calling for Islamic rule. Um, bad group of guys. We decided that we, you know, we had a quick, quick uh, meeting on the spot. You know, let's let's jump out. I'll shoot some pictures. He's going to like roll a couple seconds of video on his phone or whatever. Maybe talk to somebody, get back in the van, and go. Moment we got out of the vehicle, we realized it was a bad idea. The crowd suddenly turned on us. We went back to the vehicle. They surrounded it. I remember looking out the windows and seeing, you know, all these faces and hands slapping and the, the rocking the, the van. And it was just that, that doomsday moment of, like, what the hell were we thinking jumping out at, at that type of demonstration? Like, what made us even 
think we could get away with that. Um, it was through our amazing two translators and our drivers uh, that they managed to, to talk our way out of that. Um, and I, I just couldn't believe it because, I mean, a guy got in our vehicle with a gun and, and demanded that we go to their, what he called their base for questioning. And we just knew that we would never see the light of day again. This is the one picture I took at the demonstration when we got out before the crowd suddenly noticed us and, and turned. You know, uh, uh, others have not been so fortunate as us in that situation there. Um, you know, we've watched helplessly as fellow journalists, um, you know, have been very publicly executed um, and these, you know, on the uh, displayed on the internet, uh, the, this this fear campaign has has worked. It's not only terrified journalist population, but an entire region of the world. Um, you know, John Cantley is, is you know continues to be used as this kind of puppet journalist, you know, masquerading as a as a uh, news broadcaster. Um, Drone camera videos, I'm sure you've all seen them. They're very slick. Um, and we have to ask ourselves, you know, what, what we are accepting as news. We're not able to go there. The New York Times doesn't go there anymore to Syria. Um, and, you know, how can we accurately report on the ground without correspondence walking through that territory, collecting shell casings, studying blast patterns, having that amazing kind of photographer correspondent team that creates such rich journalism that comes back to the readers and, and in a way that, that, that is just the, 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 the most valuable way. You know, do we lo rely solely on local contacts to do that? Um, that can work. There are some amazing journalists there. Um, you know, for there, there was a, unfortunately for photography, it's you know we there was a teenage Syrian photographer last year. They think he was about 17 years old. They they, he was, many argue he's a lot younger. Who was shooting for Reuters. Um, he was killed during a battle for a hospital. And Reuters came under a lot of criticism about what allowed them to be employing somebody, you know, without proper training, sending basically a child up into frontline war. Um, so that's the problem that we face today. And do we, do we you know, we're, we're not any longer deciding, like, do we go down this road or not? Um, or should we go to that hospital or not? We're, we're deciding whether we go to entire regions or entire countries anymore. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I've never been entirely shut out of a country until now. I, there's always been a way in. I'm sure a lot of you sitting around here know, like, no matter where you go, there's always some way in. There's always some side that you can work with. Um, and that's becoming smaller and more difficult to, to find out there. Um, so we're kind of entering a different, a different era in, in, in that type of journalism. And, uh, and uh, that would be something I hope that, uh, you know, we think we're now going into a Q&A. But, uh, but um, I appreciate you listening to what I have to say about about the work I do and, and kind of some of my thoughts about it. And um, that's it. Yeah. Thank you. Which of my questions to ask? <laughs> I, um, 
The what I've been hearing a lot about um, the about photography in Syria and other places uh, is that, and in terms of local reaction to photographers in particular, is that more and more. Um, because the technology, the basic technology, is now so cheap and so widely used, um, the f press photographers from all over the world are no longer quite as welcomed. It's no longer seen that you know that people are bearing witness in the same way. People are creating their own images, either as propaganda or just creating them, sending them out themselves. Like the, the horrible videos of journalists being beheaded being an example. I mean, how do you think the widespread availability <coughs> of camera and phone technology by local people everywhere is changing the work that you do? Well, I, I think, you know, it, it, it would be... Uh, I completely support... Uh, I mean, the, the, I, I'm in the, the news business and, and free-flowing information is everything that my job is about. Um, and I think it's great that people are, are recording what's going on around them. Um, the, the difference is that, that people, you know, we, we professional journalists have a, a certain amount of, of uh, you know, there's a, there's a code of ethics. There are certain rules that go into it. I mean, we've all seen, you know, all kinds of things that happen that, that photographers may not even realize is wrong. And that could be, you know, handing a guitar to a group of fighters and having them play. That happened. Um, these, sometimes they get caught, probably 99% of the time they don't. So you have to ask yourself, the big question is, you know, what do you accept as real? What do you accept as news? Um, everything we see on the internet? No. I mean, it's, it's you, you have to, there has to be some kind of, of, of filter that, that says, okay, this actually happened, this is real. Especially with the technology you're talking about with Photoshop <laughs> and, and the amount of propaganda out there right now. Tyler, do you think that the criticism you received for the Gaza work is fair, and how did it change you personally? Gaza is a place that if, if you go and cover that place, you're going to get hammered. Uh, it's just part of it. It's, it's, there's nowhere in the world I've worked that, that um, comes under uh, more scrutiny uh, and, and very personal. Um, every time I go, it's, it's, there's a lot of stuff that comes out on the Internet. Largely, you know, the, the New York Times is a huge target, um, and therefore anyone working for them becomes a target. My, my job really is, 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 especially when I'm actually in the field working, I, I want to take my pictures, file them, and then uh, not look at, at the comments, not, you know, it's, 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 um, it's too much. It's, it's an emotional drain. You know, you get tempted to, to, um, to, to respond, which is really the worst thing you can do most of the time, at least for me, I think it would not be good. And um, it's, it's just, uh, you know, you have to have thick skin, and, and, and people do make it personal. Um, I've, I've been called all kinds of names, on, uh, and, and, and actually, like, an entire website <laughs> devoted to, to kind of trying to defame me and that kind of thing. And it, and it can be dangerous also. Like, a, a lot of the stuff that's said on there, it's out there. It's on the Internet. Um, you know, I... I um, have stuff out there. If, if, you, if you Googled me and I, I happened to be captured and they believed what they were reading, it would probably be a big problem for me. Oh, it's you. Okay. Hi, I'm Ann Marimo, one of the current Lehman Fellows. Um, could you clarify when you talk about Syria, would you like to be able to go into Syria? Is that just the New York Times stopping no, you from going? Or? I, I was asked earlier if there's one place I'd like to be covering that I, that I you know, one place, uh, that, that would be it. I, um, uh, we all imagine what, like, to be able to be embedded, for example, with the Taliban or with ISIS, to actually see the other side of what's going on there. Um, I, I, I find it very frustrating to not be able to cover that 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 crisis at all. Um, yes, you can go to the Turkish border and uh, get get uh, displaced people. 
Um, there, there are ways to kind of do it, but as far as going into Syria, I don't think, especially the way I look, you know, I wouldn't last five minutes there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's frustrating. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a big part of the world. It's important. Uh, a lot of people are suffering, and we're, we're unable to cover it. Um, Tyler, I'll just, you, you mentioned Molhem Barakat, the, the young Reuters photographer mm -hmm. who was killed. Um, and they kind of haven't changed their policies, but I see that AFP now, they put the blog post out that they refuse to even buy pictures from freelancers, either local or not in mm -hmm. Syria. What is the Times' policy on this? Uh, well, in that, in that case, they say that they are um, not going to... They, they wouldn't send a freelancer into any place that they wouldn't send a staffer into. Um, and they're not sending staff there. So that, that uh, um, so the, the times, you know, we, we, we go with what, what is available on the wire agencies. You know, that's, that's, that's what, what the access is for us. Um, you know, we, we haven't been um, hiring local photographers to work individually for us on assignment there. No, but AFP was, had a different, sorry. As a mm. AFP had a different approach. They said, even if you go on your own as a freelancer, if you live yes. there, we refuse to buy your pictures because of the yeah. Involved. It's a liability issue. Yeah, yeah. And and, and um, I I don't know precisely what the what the Times policy is on that, but I, I given their the history of you know even um, on, on military embeds in Afghanistan and things like this, they wouldn't send anyone staff or freelance unless so they had prior proper combat experience. So we're not setting, um, you know, I, as far as taking from somebody, I think that that's, you know, gets into quite a lot of liability issues. I'm not 100% briefed on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my name is Paul Beer, and I'm at the Radcliffe Institute here at Harvard. And um, as someone who's had the good fortune of being in Gaza a number of times uh, and been very uh, beguiled and taken by it, um, how do you, as a photographer, who, who clearly seems to have resonated with a lot of the uh, life and circumstance there, uh, deal with um, what I've always thought of as being a kind of three-act opera, right? So the centerpiece of the opera is, is these wars that continue to happen every two or three years, but then there's the pre and the post. Mm. And how do you, as a photographer, handle that? Um, and because it seems like in a position of Gaza, which is correct in the extreme case, uh, penned in, uh, hyper uh, condensed location with really political entities forcing it into conditions that are really unbelievable. Um, how do you handle that with your images? Well, you know, we, we I try to, um, you know, given the opportunity, I like to be to, to cover these places outside of the uh, kind of the, the, the peak of just the conflict. Um, and and I have been there uh, a number of times during those during those times, and it's 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 you know the thing about <coughs> it, it it really is unbelievable to me when I go there, um, even after being so many times and seeing that people are living that way, uh, that that people are actually living in in this strip of land which is really like a huge jail. Um, you know, I think that someday we're going to look back at that, um, maybe not in our generation, but who knows when, and we're going to say, like, God, I, that's amazing that that happened. Um, the solution to that, boy, I, I don't know, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a very, it is, as you said, it's, it's, it's an emotional place because there's something about their understanding, and some may argue, you know, this is, are they using you like propaganda? And I, there's always that element that you can be used, and you have to be aware of that. But there is an understanding of of why we are there. I think more than anywhere I've been, um, that the foreign press is here, and you know, allow them to do their work. <coughs> um, that's a that's a pretty rare thing these days, and it's it's. Um, and it's a rare understanding for people to have in a place that has so little access to the outside world. Yeah, um, thanks for coming. Um, Thank you. There seems to be a very good generation of young uh, photojournalists, but uh, at least my friends, they're not making enough money to, to pay the rent or to even live on photography. And uh, I was wondering, if you 
the thing that they, there is this fear that there will not be a, a next generation of journalists because mm -hmm. I just two days ago I got a, an email from one of my friends saying that he's quitting because mm -hmm. uh, he's getting rates like fifty sixty dollars for for his, for his job and uh, I wonder what you think about that and what could we do for newspapers to again you know put the importance on, on the job. It's, 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 I mean, no question, it's uh, an extremely difficult atmosphere out there right now. But at the same time, it's always been really hard. I mean, I think back to, to when I was just starting out in this, this type of work, um, you know, I, I went way into debt my first couple of years doing it. And um, uh, I do consider myself lucky that I started to get work and, and, and crawled back from that. But, but it is, um, you know, there's this catch-22 where you, you're starting out, you don't have the experience yet. Um, so you can't get an assignment and you can't work unless you have an assignment to make money. So that's, uh, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing. I don't think that, you know, the, 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 the fear that I have is more about, um, you know, video taking over still photography, like still photography becoming more of a fine art medium um, and, 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 and being pushed away from, from, from journalism. And, you know, for me, I, 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 it might just be the way I remember things, but like, I think that the way that most of our minds work is that, you know, still image is, is something that you remember. It, 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 like, it can burn into your mind. And that never happens for me with video. You know, like I, I think about when I was a kid and I, what, what, what inspired me as a, uh, what inspired me to be a photographer, looking at these old time life books and looking at, you know, the books of great photojournalists and the, uh, um, uh, and that the, there are specific images, you know, they're, they're not moving pictures. I mean, if you look at the, the, the Eddie Adams execution photo, um, that's such a, you know, you can stare at that for such a long time. And there's, there's also, you know, there's a TV cameraman like rolling video on it. And it's just, it's something you just don't even want to look at, you know. Um, it's such a different thing. So that, that's what I really hope that, that we don't lose that. Um, because those still images are what really have the lasting power that will stay with us in a, in a historic way forever. Thanks for coming. Um, for those of us who are writers uh, for uh, newspapers with um, websites, and uh, we complain a lot about uh, the constant, the 24-hour rolling deadline, and how quickly we have to get things up on the web as writers. Can you talk about as a photographer what that's meant for you um, and how that's changed? Yeah, it, it's changed a lot. I mean, I uh, when I started out, even with the Times, it was you know you'd file once a day, and we'd only had to file it. And I could file very liberally late because of the time change. Usually, you know, when you're abroad, you, you're, you're, you're ahead seven, eight, nine hours, whatever it is, and you can, uh, you know, go have dinner and hang out and file late at night and go to bed. And uh, now it's, 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 you know, it's a 24-hour thing. I, I file probably four times a day for, for the paper when I'm on a breaking news story. Um, and that, that, you know, it, it, it kind of takes away from, from some of the luxury that I had working for a newspaper, not for a wire agency. I'd always, you know, the guys who had to file over and over every day, I always thought like, oh man, I, I wouldn't be able to do that. And now I find myself doing it all the time because if you don't, then, you know, the, 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 there's going to be someone else's picture suddenly goes up and it takes a a good while to get them to swap it out in the middle of the night. So, um, so that atmosphere has certainly changed quite a bit. Um, but, but of course, with you know the um, pretty much everywhere that I go um, is 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 so wired up now. I mean, even Gaza has has really fast internet, and you can file from your even like a crummy hotel room, you know, it's lightning fast. So it's pretty amazing. Hi there. Hi. Um, my name is Denise. I'm a reporter with the Orlando Sentinel. And something you said earlier in your speech, I was really curious about. You mentioned um, gauging or reading body language, and I was wondering if you could just elaborate on that. Talk about how that affects how you do what you mm -hmm. do. 
Yeah, I think body language is, is, is extremely important. Um, gauging a crowd, you know, um, gauging how people are reacting to your presence. This is one of the biggest things you can uh, uh, be aware of as far as safety is concerned. Um, I have not always been the best at it, uh, but sometimes you can kind of just, it, it, it's kind of a feeling that you see from people. Um, it can be from a distance, but uh, you know things can go bad very quickly. I mean, even even in Gaza, where where you know I've been talking about how how amazing it is to work there. I mean, I um, I there was one morning when um, you know there's a, a neighbor a specific neighborhood that was getting really pounded. I mean, they 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 were a lot of shells overnight, still continuing. They're really they were trying to get the civilian population out of there, so thousands of people were coming out. And you know you have to be you have to be careful about women, and um, uh, they're, they're, it's a very conservative neighborhood. So uh, taking photographs is a little bit tricky. But I, I just you know one very random photo of just a a crowd that I took. Um, I, the next thing I knew, I had two guys and four guys and ten guys, you know, wanting to uh, knock my face in and um, grabbing my cameras and. The more I kind of tried to get away from them, um, the the more people got involved, and it, it was bad. I was, you know, not only about to uh, get beaten up, but I was about to lose all my work from, uh, you know, three or four hours of of a pretty dramatic scene, and ultimately I just I ran. I just, you know, I, I run a lot and. Uh, on my spare time, I'm pretty. I'm pretty fast, actually. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm 45, but uh, you know, the, most of these guys smoke. You know, even the ones. So uh, I, I, I just hauled ass and um, and I got away. You know. So. Tyler, thank you so much for for being here. We all really appreciate it. My name is Jason Grotto. I'm a current Neiman fellow. Um, I, I have some specific questions about the conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq um, and, and your work there. These wars are now the longest wars that the U.S. Have, has, has ever fought, and a very small number of the U.S. population or percentage of the U.S. population actually participated in that war. There was very little impact to those of us who live here in the United States. And I'm just wondering, as someone who put your life in danger covering that war, what is your opinion about U.S. reactions about our uh, increasing involvement in the Middle East? Uh, you know, trying to bring this information to us. It doesn't seem to be a whole lot of reaction here in the United States for the sacrifices that are being made by our soldiers, by journalists like yourself. And so I'm just curious about, you know, if you have any frustrations about this. Or well, I think you know the the I, I always I think as as interest wanes. It, it, it kind of motivates me. I, I feel like the, the, that, that's one of the things that kept me in Afghanistan for so many years. You know, a, lot of, a lot of attention shifted over to Iraq. I spent a good, a good amount of time in Iraq, but I also kept my focus during all those years in Afghanistan. Um, it's, as, as the interest gets lower, I think you have to get the tempo higher. You have to spend more time there. You have to get, you know, more time on patrols. More, you know, the 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 level of the photograph has to be more interesting. I had, you know, I, I I really felt like I had to be out on all these patrols and going out on all these things um, to the point where it's like I couldn't relax when I was home not covering it. And and if if you if I got something. Dramatic. If I got something that really, really resonated in that way, it, it would mean that much more to me to get it, um, and and that would bring attention to it. But I really think that you know, the attitude that people get of you know this kind of war fatigue, um, Afghanistan fatigue, and the, the whole thing of of like okay, it's been ten years. We know what it looks like when firefight. We know it looks like a funeral, whatever it is. You know, you, you have to keep just hammering away at it. Um, thank you so much. Um, and I recall, I'm Kitty at NPR, and I mm -hmm. so vividly recall seeing your photos from Westgate. 
and having been there a couple times, it, it had that much more of a searing. <coughs> it was almost as if you were the eye, you were the eyewitness to us and many of us who were trying to follow what was happening. So it was really powerful. And thank you. Thank you. Um, I have sort of two two different questions. One, just somebody I've worked a lot with old archival images of the Civil War, and it just struck me as um, I don't know what happens to yours, what the Times does with them, or you know, for, taking a long view, almost a hundred years. If somebody were to come back, where would they? find this sort of first person witness of this period of wars. Does that stay with the times? I assume. Well, they, you know, that, that's, that's a good question. And you have, um, you know, you, you have things that appear on the internet and then they're not on the internet and, and it's all digital. I think it's important to, you, know, you never know what's going to happen with your, with your archive and, and what's going to happen with these pictures over time. Um, you know, I keep, uh, I keep everything um, that, that, you know, all, all my major assignments I keep on, on my own hard drives as well. And, and, you know, living in Nairobi where there's, you know, you're always worried there's a gang of guys coming to steal your TV and all your stuff in the middle of the night. Um, you know, I keep a, 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 a couple hard drives, you know, one at my house, one at the office there, and then one here in, in New York. So. Um, you know, it's a lot of backing up. It's a lot of, you know, we can't kind of put stuff in a cloud there because it's, uh, we don't have that kind of internet there right now. But, um, but it is something that, you know, we don't have that same, uh, you know, those, those physical negatives and silver prints and, and, and those things anymore. But, but there is a, there is a system for it, and, and those pictures are out there, and, and uh, you know, we do our best to, to preserve them. Gary. Thank you, Todd. It was a wonderful, wonderful evening, wonderful to hear you. A um, couple of questions uh, connected, perhaps. I wonder, to, to what extent um, can you influence the way that your photographs, or do you influence the way that your photographs are published by The Times? What kind of dialogue do you have with your editors? Um, and then, should you publish them yourself one day, I hope, in a, in a book, would, the, would there be a fundamental difference? Yeah, I mean, I, I have a good relationship with my editors. I, I have a very, um, you know, I, I consider the people that, that are choosing my photographs as, as my friends, and I, 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 I see them socially when I'm, when I'm here in the States. Um, so it's, it's very open about, you know, like, I'm not going to harass them about every single um, thing that I shoot, and and you know these are professionals. They, this is what they do for a living. They, they look at the photographs. There's there's meetings throughout the day. There's a morning meeting. There's an afternoon meeting, and a lot of there's a lot of people who who um, weigh in on on what pictures actually make it, a into the printed newspaper, b onto uh, the internet. Whether that's going to be a slideshow. Um, generally, I, I, I do have, especially on big stories, um, whether it's you know, something like breaking news with Westgate or, or, or Gaza, things like this recently, um, I, I have a big say in, in, in at least on the, the web presence for the, for the slideshows and those things. I, um, we, we talk about it. We go over sequencing. We go over you know, what picture should go before another picture, how many pictures, which ones to cut. Um, that's, I think, pretty rare to have that, and, and it certainly doesn't always go my way. A lot of times it doesn't, but at least I'm, I'm, I'm heard. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good, it's, it's good. And, and the, second, the second part of your... If you were to publish a book, would it... Yeah, it? They're, they're good about that. They're, they, they have, um, you know, if I wanted to, to publish a book, I always feel like I just... I don't know what the book would be really on, you know. I I, I don't really uh, like I, I don't really see my work as something that would just go like how would it all tie together? And I always thought, feel like there's going to be something that some light will come on and say, oh, this is this is what I'll do with it. But I um, but for now, I just keep keep feeding the keep feeding the paper. Yes. I just wanted to circle back to this earlier question about so-called citizen journalism that mm. a phrase that you used, how you look, and two-part question, how do you look as a photographer? Can you elaborate a little bit more 
you know, being, <coughs> being inspired by the Vietnam era photographers. And does a beard help you? Oh. Um, <laughs> I just haven't, just haven't I haven't shaved in a little while, but I, no, I, I like, you know, the, you're, I always find like the, the, the one thing that, that journalists always get wrong, you know, when they go out and they put on the shawl kameez or whatever, they put the, the local dress. The dead giveaway are their shoes. You know, they have like $300 German hiking boots on when, when everyone else has got sandals and, and it's 20 below and, and, and snowing out. So um, that's the first thing I always look at. But this actually gets back to like the, the, what we were talking about with uh, body language. You know, I, I can tell an American a mile away in a crowd. You know, like when the way the way Americans walk, myself included, you can just see them. It's it's. So I think that you know, I kind of gave up on the whole local dress thing a long time ago. I just. <laughs> I wear jeans and a t-shirt and, you know, I, 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 I just, I, it's pretty obvious who you are, um, you know, that, you, that you're a visitor there. And, and it also cuts down on the suspicion, you know. I think if you, if you go kind of trying to fit in and then they realize there's something not right about you, then, you know, you can be tagged as being a spy and then people really get angry. Yeah. <laughs> which is how do you look as a photographer? What makes you different from the citizen journalist? What makes you the professional? <laughs> oh, um, the tone of ethics, which actually... Yeah, well, well, you know, we... we uh, <laughs> I've been doing this for a pretty long time, and, and, and I, I, I started at small daily newspapers, a really tiny one in, in uh, Troy, Ohio, and then, and then kind of a mid-sized paper in Wilmington, North Carolina. And, and those places... You know, they really, you learn a lot about, you know, what, what the rules are, what, what are, you know, not, don't set up pictures. Um, uh, the, the, the main thing is, uh, you know, you can never, there, there's no picture ever worth setting up. And if you do it, someone's going to see you. You know, most people who set up pictures get caught. Um, and, and so it, it really is, it, it's something that you learn. Like, I, you know, I said, I consider my job a trade. Um, you couldn't take somebody uh, and 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 just hand them a wrench and have them fix a car. Uh, they wouldn't. They might be able to stop the oil leaking a little bit, but they they wouldn't get it really running well. And I think it's the same with the way we are. You know, it's not just how we our, our education, um, our degrees, but it's years and years in the field of how to, you know, what's okay. And it can be it can be very subtle. Also, like I. Um, I, I won't shoot pictures if it seems like someone's even, per, you know, performing a little bit for me. Um, I'll, I'll back off, and there could be three or four other photographers, and my editor will say, well, why don't you have that picture? And I'll say, you know what, it didn't really f seem right. And, and they, they totally say, no, that's fine, you don't have that. And, and it's, it's, it's those subtleties that, that, that really matter. Following up on that a little bit, and what you said earlier in response to Laurie's question about um, the, the, the authenticity that the pictures have to be real, I wonder how you feel about um, the publication in, in many newspapers around the world of still pictures from the ISIL videos of people, who are, journalists included, who are about to be beheaded. <coughs> These are propaganda shots that have been created and staged very deliberately. They're not, they're not presented as something that a news photographer just happened to be passing mm -hmm. by court, that, that's understood. And yet occupying the place in the paper that would normally be taken by a news photograph is this constructed image that's been produced for propaganda purposes. Do you, do you feel, uh, well, I, I just wonder how you feel about that. You, you know, I, I, um, I have mixed feelings about it, but, but you know, we, we go into these places, you know, there, there's no kind of invisible force field around us out there. Um, uh, things happen and, and you have to accept that. You, you, you accept that, that you're vulnerable. Um, you go into a place where there's a war going on and you're just as uh, likely to get hit by something as, as any of the combatants. Um, so really, you know, by, by going, you know, you go, you get captured. I got captured. It happens. Um, fact that 
they shot a video of it, and and that that you know still from that runs in the newspaper. That yeah, that's news that day. Actually, that's that's something pretty big that happened, and and I think that you know that that we have a responsibility to report on that. We can't report on other people's deaths and other people's misfortunes and not our own. Um, there's no need to show graphic photos of uh, still grabs from that. And as long as it's, it's defined that this is, you know, this was shot reportedly in such and such desert, and this is su supposedly this person. And that's, that's what we're seeing so much more these days. I mean, there's always this kind of, this footnote on pictures. This, this is said to be in this place or said to be this person because there is no verification of these images. Yes, the red, yeah. Uh, my name is Jill Goldenzill. I'm a research fellow at the Belfer Center. And we've heard, uh, we've heard a lot about how the Islamic State is using social media to get its message out and also to recruit foreign fighters. And I was wondering if you could say a little bit about how insurgent groups, and the Islamic State in particular, are using print media and um, photojournalism to, uh, and, and particularly Western photojournalism and, and uh, journalists, to, uh, for, the same, for similar purposes, to get their, get their own messages across and out there. And also, is this something you've seen changing over time? Is this something that uh, insurgent groups are doing more and more and more of, or more or less of now that we are seeing um, citizen journalism happen more and more? And in in those circumstances, how how do you make sure that that you're not being used for their propaganda purposes as well? Well, you know, I, I I've never seen the quality of these, uh, you know, this propaganda kind of claiming to be news, little news broadcasts that I've seen um, by, by ISIS, uh, especially like these, you know, with the technology that we have now with these drone camera angles. And I mean, some of these things are just, I mean, they're like, they're like music videos. Um, and and uh, they reach a lot of people. It's, it's, I certainly have not seen that, you know, nothing like that from any other kind of insurgent group before. Um, a lot of this, I'm sure, is you know produced outside of the country, and um, they have a lot of resource to to put these together. And and um, it is something that uh, we have to be very careful about when um, looking at this stuff. I mean, I don't really, I, I, I don't look at that stuff. I mean, certainly, I don't look at. I, I I've never watched any of the um, videos of our of our colleagues um, being killed. Uh, that that's something that I just. Would not be able to 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 watch, um, and 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 that being said, these other these this other stuff is is really it's it's not it's not news. It's it's simply part of this whole campaign to scare people um, and to recruit, just like you were saying. Um, how that affects us as journalists, I think that. Um, you know, we, we just have to try, like I was saying before, I mean, we don't really have an answer to it. Like how, how do we get real news from there? And actually, I mean, I, I, I watched that John Cantley kind of stand up thing is fascinating to see him, you know, I, I think, you know, we've all kind of thought about what it would be like to to, to be permitted on the other side, like if the Taliban suddenly let you be a reporter for them. Um, obviously, he's their prisoner, but but it, it, it is almost like it's like a car accident. You can't keep from looking at it. Oh, I... uh, Melissa, I'm a Neiman Fellow from New Haven. Um, are you under pressure from the Times to market your own work through social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and if so, how has that changed your work? Um, we're not under pressure. I think you know they they they, they certainly support it, and and I, I have to say I'm a little bit old fashioned. I, I still don't shoot video. I you know I'm a bit of a dinosaur in the industry, and and um, and uh, the whole like all the social media stuff I think is very good, and I I, I tend to use it in spikes. Like I, I Twitter, um, 
I use while I'm on assignment, um, and and I uh, to kind of update about what's happening, and and um, but I don't, but I don't live on Twitter and Facebook and these things. Um, they're they're amazing resources, and and you know it's become more and more a part of our site. Uh, it's 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 really something that we. Uh, that I should be more involved in, but yeah, the, the, the paper completely supports us us using those things, and and um, something I definitely I'm a little bit embarrassed for as little as I do. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, seeing your photos from Westgate Mall again um, this time, I was I think I was probably gripped equally by horror of what I saw and the terror of thinking that you were actually that close to guns that could have been trained at you any second. And I know you talked a little bit about this in your address, but could you say a little bit more about whatever calculation of risk you thought you were once you were in there and how you could possibly guard against anything happening to you at that point? Yeah, I'd, I'd say actually the, the, um, the worst part of, uh, you know, the, the, the most exposed I had was actually outside the mall. I, I, um, when I entered, there was kind of a, a, a an upper parking lot that I went up to, and 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 I it, I kind of I I'd been to this mall before, um, and so I kind of knew what the layout generally was, and that there was a parking deck up there, and I got up there, and it was separated from the building, um, and there was a lot of gunfire going on, so I had a big open area to run across. That was that was the most I was exposed, actually, kind of getting inside. Once inside, you know, it's one of these things like you don't know what's there, you don't know what's behind the door. Um, but once there, uh, I actually attached myself to um, the, the Kenyan police. Really, you know, they, they they're, they're 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 completely underpaid. It's a big problem. There's uh, um, you know, there's a lot of looting and all this kind of stuff that happened by the, on on the part of the military and the police. But I saw some guys that um, that looked like I first saw that these guys like special forces or something. Um, they 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 had like you know those those orange shooting glasses on and, and really kind of high-speed gear with the Velcro pouches and expensive Glock uh, pistols and that kind of thing. And um, I started kind of shadowing them. Um, and, and, and then the, the police started shadowing them. It turns out these guys were just some South African guys who were down the street doing target practice like at, a, <laughs> at a gun club. And... Uh, they heard this was going on and they just ran over there like this is much more better than paintball, you know. <laughs> and uh, and 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 furthermore, like they they were more than happy to let me tag along with them. And they they actually were clearing hallways, you know, like you see, actually not just running across open areas. And 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 no kidding, like the army was following them, thinking that they were like, you know, it was very strange. So. <laughs> Yes. Tyler, could you just say a little bit more about something you talked about at the beginning about this sort of this change in in what it was like to cover combat and what it's like now? And I'm wondering if you can pinpoint something, um, an event, um, some transition um, that took place um, that took journalists from and the, it, and journalists have always been at risk in combat situations, but that took journalists from a place of relative, and I underscore the word relative security, to um, a state where there is no such thing <clears throat> as that anymore. What happened? Well, I, I think, you know, the, the, the journalists have always been uh, covering wars, have been in danger. and. Like I said before, like you know, the, really the turning point I think was 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 Libya. That's where we first saw not only um, people, you know, it's, it's extremely dangerous. I mean, if you think about <coughs> running around in Libya in the middle of a war, it's just you think back to it, and and, and it's just that's a really dangerous place to be. And. There were things that happened that you would expect happen. A mortar comes, you know, an errant mortar comes in and, and hits some journalists. Um, but there were other things that happened, you know, like people, 
driving down these roads. I mean, we had just like this one highway that, that basically bisected the country, and um, there wasn't really a front line. It was very fluid, and um, and it 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 it. it turned into a situation where it was just so confused that the people were getting captured. People were killed out in the desert. Some journalist, you know, one journalist's body's never been found. People are captured, tortured. Uh, myself and, and, uh, and, and the others from the New York Times, and they, they threatened uh, to execute us, decapitate us. You know, they, they beat us up. Uh, Lindsay Adario, who was among us, uh, you know, I, I watched as uh, a guy, you know, punched her closed fists in the face. Um, they tried to drag her out of our prison cell. It, it was, it was really bad. And then we we got out. We realized it got even worse. And um, the unfortunate thing is that that. It's the, it's the people at the beginning of this that learn those lessons that teach the rest of us what the tempo is. That's what we saw in Syria. People who, you know, there were a lot of journalists covering Syria. There were a lot of, you know, I, I, I'd see other photographers there in the beginning. You know, it was, it, was a, it was quite a crowd. And the unlucky ones are the ones that we learned from. You can be captured. You can be executed by these people. I'd say that those two places are really the ones that, that have shifted really oh, something that, 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 you know, we just because we're journalists doesn't mean that we have any level of protection. In fact, we're much bigger targets than if we weren't journalists. Uh, we're used. We're manipulated. Uh, we're, 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 we're put out there in a way that, that is, is completely humiliating. And, uh, and, and, and that's, that's the difference, that, that we are, 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 are targeted there in, in, in a way that is, is the most fearful way. I mean, uh, the way that they're killing journalists is, is you know, a pretty clear sign of, of, of how we are how much journalists are welcome in that country, in that region. So, um, you know, I think that we have learned from that. And, and now we have to, you know, I think that we have to be thankful to, to the people who have sacrificed their lives uh, in these places. I mean, one thing that we have to remember is that all of these people, whether they're still being held or if they, they were killed, they were there for, 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 you know, they knew it was dangerous. They weren't there. It wasn't a game to them. Um, they all have families, uh, wives, parents. Um, you know, they, they were taking a huge risk uh, to, to bring information uh, about other people that they cared about strongly enough to risk their lives. And um, so, you know, I, 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 I applaud them. And, and, and it's actually... I have kind of the opposite reaction of, of, of some people. Like, it, it, it motivates me. Like, I think about my friends who've died or my friends who've been very badly injured. And, um, you know, I think they'd, they'd want me to keep doing this work. They'd want, you know, to, to stop is almost like, you know, that's what I gave my life for. Like, that, that now there's going to be less information out there. I feel like there should be more. Um, you know, as long as you're comfortable doing it, I think that it's, it's, a, it's an important thing to do.